Hello. <laughs> this is the first of maybe maybe many um, freestyle lectures on Epistolution. I am in front of my Zoom background here, which is a beautiful forested scene from our farm in Vaughan, Mississippi. And I'm actually sitting in my apartment, um, chilling out. And I was going to start these lectures because I've been doing a lot of writing about Epistolution, but the writing is going so slow and my mind is going so fast. And so I want to get this uh, material recorded somehow. And maybe sometime in the future, this will be interesting to someone. And they will dredge up these recordings and watch them. They're going to be published. So, um, so let's get started. I'm going to begin at the very beginning. I'm going to assume that you know nothing about Epistolution and you haven't read anything I've ever written. So um, the first question I'll handle here is, what is Epistolution? What on earth am I talking about? Um I'm going to talk about the, the basic concept and then I'm just going to drift. I'm going to talk about whatever's on my mind that relates to Epistolution and we'll see how long this um, recording goes and then I'll make more. So um, this will just be freestyle. What is Epistolution? Epistolution is a theory of knowledge. Um, what do I mean by knowledge? Knowledge is embodied theories that more accurately predict reality. So I have in mind here a sort of scientific knowledge, although um, you'll see as you get familiar with the Epistolution, it extends to every living cell. So every living cell is in the business of creating these embodied theories that accurately predict reality. Um, so it's intertwined with evolution. This is a um, knowledge is a thing that organisms produce um whatever kind of organism they are um turtles fish birds um bacteria all all of it is in the business of producing knowledge um, my little slogan is being is for knowing and so um this is kind of an inversion of the ordinary way of thinking of things normally we would think that um knowing is something that has evolved to help us survive and reproduce that knowledge intelligence is something that is sort of secondary to evolution and it's emerged at the end it's emergent um a property of only very complicated organisms like humans and chimpanzees and dolphins and that sort of thing but my theory is that it goes all the way back to the single-celled origins of life, the very first universal common ancestor that we're all descended from, everyone, even bacteria and archaea and algae and mosses, liverworts, ferns, pine trees, grass, all of it's descended from common ancestor. We're all cousins, if you will, distant cousins. Um, we've all been evolving for the exact same period of time. Since that universal common ancestor, even very simple bacteria has been around reproducing for just as long as the lineage that produced you and me has been around. So um, it's had a long time to accumulate knowledge. And um, the word I have invented for that accumulation of knowledge, since I think of it so differently, is incumulation. Uh, my friend Barry thinks that I made up this word to to tease her but i haven't it's actually i think a useful word incumulation means um reorganizing oneself to um take in something so um knowledge incumulates in organisms which means that it re is sort of reintegrated into their system and um knowledge is teleological i mean there's better knowledge and and worse knowledge um, it's a prediction about reality, right? So you can have an accurate prediction or a crappy prediction, and um, that's empirically measurable. Um, of course, evolution measures that accuracy by whether you can survive, right? So if your knowledge is no good, your predictions are no good about reality, then you can't survive very long because you do foolish things. <laughs> you make mistakes that you 
you shouldn't make and you get terminated um, instead of doing what you desire to do, which is usually in some form survive and reproduce. But deep down below that desire is the desire to accumulate knowledge, incumulate, incumulate knowledge. So uh, epistolution is, um, is the way that an organism is set up, um, which is very different from a machine um, or a computer program. We'll get into all that later, I'm sure. But um, the best way to introduce the topic is to think about genes. Um, so the, the dominant view of life at the moment is this gene-centric view. Uh, it's been undermined by biology recently, but it hasn't been replaced by anything very compelling. So um, we're still kind of stuck with this Dawkins era um, gene-centric selfish gene version of biology, which is that um, genes essentially use organisms as vehicles to re replicate themselves. And so you can see the organism as this emergent phenomenon that was sort of driven or created by the genes that it carries in order to propagate genes. And there's no other uh, rationale to life other than that. Um, it's just this sort of accidental happenstance that doesn't follow any teleology at all. It's just um, whatever got reproduced is what's here today. And um, there's really no meaning or purpose to life in that uh, cosmological framing of what we are as living beings. And I think that's false and I think it's provably false. Um, the first way to think about it is to think about um, where the instructions for life come from. And um, this is something I've been writing about today and yesterday and the day before in criticizing this book, brilliant book written by Siddhartha Mukherjee, which I really like, called The Song of the Cell. Um, and I'm criticizing it because it's so good. <laughs> and uh, it's good to criticize a good, a high quality thinker um, because it makes your criticism better. <laughs> and it makes your, your thinking better. So um, I really like Mukherjee and um, the idea I'm criticizing is, is uh, an inconsistency in his own theory, which is that he, um, he describes uh, the genes in the cell. A gene, first of all, is um, a segment section of DNA that's just made of four base pairs, uh, or the four different you know amino acids that uh, form base pairs and code for a protein. For so the cell can produce a protein from this template of a genetic sequence that is um, in the DNA strand, and all a protein is typically a very complicated molecule it's um fairly unique and it serves a very particular purpose in the cell and this list of templates for building proteins is is what we call our genetic code and um code is a perfectly good word for what the genetic sequence is it is sequential i mean there's a strand that's one after another there are 26 chromosomes, um, sorry, 40, 23, 46 chromosomes um, in a human cell. And um, those chromosomes carry a tremendously long list of this genetic sequence, but they're basically 30,000, 25,000 to 30,000 sequences in there that code for a unique protein that we can see that you know that's a template that when the gene expression machinery gets a hold of it it produces a protein that's unique um and there are 30,000 of those roughly so that's how many um books there are in the library you could say or tools there are in the toolbox um but the way that code is put together and sequenced, like the way that it's structured, 
and also its physical structure and the things that are interspersed between those 30,000 sequences. Um, that's considered uh, not a list or a library. It's considered uh, instructions for how to make a cell and for what the cell is supposed to do. And that's the idea that I'm criticizing, that the instructions for what to do, what to become, are in the list of genes, so in the genetic code. Um, the simple, like stupid version of that idea is called genetic determinism. And that's just like kind of seeing us as like robots that are just controlled by our genes and nothing else. And obviously that ignores the influence of the environment entirely almost. And, um, Try, doesn't even try to make sense of the influence of the environment. It just says we're just determined by our genes. And so um, not very many um, thinkers really reflect a pure version of that anymore because it's so unrealistic. So um, genetic determinism is kind of out of favor. Um, and instead, what you have is some combination of genes in the environment but the environment is considered to be sort of um, secondary or kind of um, accidental, uh, that the thing that really persists in evolution is this genetic set of genetic instructions. And so the, the instructions are, are generic enough that this is the, the normal view is that the instructions are generic enough that the environment can vary and the instructions will still work in these different conditions. And because they basically work in these different conditions, they get reproduced and they get passed on and they live to fight another day. So these instructions are like immortal, you know, that they, they have been around slowly being modified by random mutations, which just happened by accident with no purpose involved for the whole history of life, um, four billion years. And in that view, that the influence of the environment is just sort of accidental. And the instructions are where the, the genetic code is where the instructions that give the the cell its ability to organize, to self-organize. That's where that lives. And I'm criticizing that view. I, I think that view is um, clearly, obviously wrong. And um, the reason it's obviously wrong is that with the same set of instructions, um, any cell can, um, it, for example, in a human body, um, differentiate into 200 different cell types. So all the different parts of your body um, you know, the retinas of your eyes and the skin and uh, muscles and uh, bones and neurons, cardiac cells and liver cells. All these are radically different structures that are built out of cells. Well, all those cells have the same genetic code, right? So same set of instructions. And what makes those cells differentiate is the conditions that they're in. So uh, Mukherjee calls those extrinsic factors. Those extrinsic factors are incredibly difficult to, to study um, because they're so particular and so tiny set of conditions around an individual cell that determines it's the way it differentiates. Um, genes are relatively easy to study, right? Because they're just part of a particular molecule. We can knock them in and out with the new genetic engineering technology we can sequence it now like we're we're in the era of manipulating genes we have not yet gotten to the era of manipulating cell environments to change the way that cells develop and when we get to that era we will realize that this gene thing was you know uh, not as big a deal as we thought and we actually were just at the very very beginnings of our understanding of life um so uh, my view is that pistolution view is that the instructions are actually in the cellular environment. That's what tells the cell what genes to turn on and off. 
it's fairly obvious that that's the case. And Mukherjee himself says that in his book and, but doesn't grasp it. And um, it's hard to grasp. And so a solution is not introducing any new facts. Like there's new, no new biological facts here. It's just a reinterpretation of the existing facts. I mean, facts are really just observations based on theories. And so it's a re it's a new theory to interpret the same facts and, and make better sense of them. Uh, because if the instructions were in the genes, <clears throat> then um, it would be hard to explain how the environment can turn on and off these instructions in a certain functional pattern. Um, so you have, if you think about it, you have 30,000 individual proteins that can be produced or not produced at any particular point in time. The unique way that um, 30,000 units can be combined is um, a bigger number is an incredibly big, 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 big number, uh, bigger than all the elemental particles in the observable universe. Um, big number. Okay. And yet we don't see just random turning on and off of genes. We see very specific genes turned on and off at very specific times. Uh, to produce a functional cell. So in my world, that um, constitutes instruction. That's the instructions. That's telling the cell what genes to, to turn on and off, what proteins to make, what to become. And Mukherjee even says, you know, that the extrinsic factors outside the cell are what tells the cell what to become, what to become, where to go, what to do. Okay. Those are the instructions. The genetic sequence is just a library of templates for building the proteins that carry out the instructions. So the difference between tools and instructions sounds like very subtle, but it's incredibly profoundly important for understanding what life is doing and how it's structured and how the process of life came about. And, and where it's going. So uh, the second um, way of understanding why a piss solution has to be true is that um, we now have this new evidence in evolutionary biology about genes. So um, if it were true that the instructions were in the genetic sequence, then um, it the way it would work is that um, the genetic sequence would be passed on and changes in the cell that interpreted the instructions would not be significant. And furthermore, they would have to be not inherited or at least not inherited for very long because if they were inherited, if you have a set of instructions and then a way of interpreting the instructions and carrying them out, um, the way of carrying instructions out has to remain more or less constant for the instructions to still be relevant, especially if they're extremely complicated, like the instructions for life. So instructions for life, as I said, could be interpreted in so many different ways. It's more than the particles of the universe. So it's got to be narrowed down to a very, very thin slice of possibilities um, of interpretation. <clears throat> so, now what we have in evolutionary biology and in, in biology all over the place is this discovery of epigenetics. So everyone's heard of that. Um, it's not that we've discovered epigenetics for the first time. We've known that cells differentiate and that's epigenetic change, right? What we're now discovering is that those epigenetic changes can be inherited um, indefinitely. And it happens very frequently all over nature in all sorts of organisms and possibly in, in all organisms. So if those changes in the uh, way of interpreting the genetic code can change, um, and then those changes can be inherited, um, it proves that the instructions for life are not in the genetic code, because if they were, then that the functionality of that code would be eroded by a game of telephone by the inherited changes in interpretation. So it'd be a game of telephone where the, um, it'd be as if, you know, you have your instruction manual here 
and your way of interpreting it is changing. Like you're changing the meaning of the words and that change is just being inherited. It's drifting. So suddenly the instruction book doesn't match at all conditions. So if that inheritance went on very long, that lineage of organisms would go extinct. And so that's disallowed by the, by the genes first theory of evolution. And, and yet we're finding that result all over nature. So it proves that the instructions are not in the genetic code. They're in the environment and uh, the extrinsic factors around the cell that are forcing the cell to interpret the genome in a certain way. And so that turns the whole theory of evolution on its head. And when I first invented epistolution, I called it the upside down theory of evolution. Um, this is all a really tricky idea to get your mind around. It took me several years. And I'm the one who invented it. So uh, it's going to take um, everyone time to get used to this new reality, but it's inevitable because um, there's no other way to look at these facts uh, and make sense of them. At least it doesn't seem that way to me. So um, I got to take a little sip of coffee with that thought for a moment. Okay. Um, where should I go next with this? How, how can the environment, how can the extrinsic factors around the cell um, the influences that the cell is embedded in, how can they be instructions? Those seem like they change. They change too much for them to be instructions. Uh, okay, so the, it's a mystery, right? We don't know. We just know that that's how it works. Uh, one thing it indicates to me is that um, these epigenetic changes are biased in favor of function. So what that means is that um, the previous assumption was that uh, if, if interpretations of the genome varied based on varying environmental conditions, that variability was accidental random, stochastic. Okay. And um, whatever order was seen there, whatever intelligence was embodied in those um, interpretations was attributed to the genes. And the genes were selected over time through natural selection. So natural selection is um, happens when organisms either die off without producing offspring or they produce offspring, thereby passing on their genetic material. Okay, so that accounts for whatever functionality is accumulated, whatever knowledge or intelligence or functionality is accumulated in the genetic code. Okay, um, but since now we know that the genetic code is not where the instructions are, okay, that's not really where the intelligence, knowledge, functionality is accumulating. It, it's certainly part of it, but it also means that the cell itself carries intelligence, knowledge, um, functionality, because changes are inherited. Changes in the cellular interpretation of the genes are inherited. So that means the whole cell is a carrier. And that also means that those changes are biased towards function because if they were unbiased, it would be that game of telephone that I talked about earlier. So how could they be biased towards function? How could, um, how could the cell become better at interpreting its own genome as it lives as it, during active life? 
Um, that's a mystery. Wide open question. Um, and so a solution is the recognition that that is taking place. Um, and my personal way of explaining it is based on oscillators and it's based on the idea of a blind search. I have no proof that my way of explaining my theory is correct. A solution, I'm pretty certain is correct because I don't see any other way to interpret nature other than a piss solution. So the big picture, like conclusions I'm coming to here are pretty secure in my view. Um, but my my hunches about how a piss solution is actually carried out at the cellular level are just hunches, right? They're just guesses and they could be right or they could be totally wrong. Um, they're probably a combination of both, but here's my, here's my idea for how um, the development of the cell could be non-random biased toward function and could be accumulating knowledge and intelligence through, through the act of life um, without involving genes. Okay. Um, well, if you think about how uh, knowledge accumulates was supposed to have been accumulating in the, in the genome, um, it was through natural selection. Well, of course, natural selection acts on the cells as well. It doesn't just act on the genes, right? All genes are encapsulated in a cell. So it applies to this problem just as well as it applies to, it applies to instructions in the cell and the cell environment just as well as it applies to instructions in the genome because natural selection acts on both. But we have to find a way, since the genes don't change over the course of the life of the cell, we have to find a way that it also acts on the cellular mechanism as a whole during active life. It becomes smarter. It learns. It learns. So just think about that for a moment. It's obvious that organisms learn. It's obvious that they adjust to their environment as they live. They get better at living in the environment that they find themselves in. If you could see this in every example of life, like you get accustomed to things right you don't get worse at living in the conditions you find yourself in you get better you get better at it you learn and not just you but everything even plants right if they're grown in arid conditions they grow more roots and that constitutes a better way of living than the normal amount of roots right because they, they are grown in arid conditions they need to put more into searching for for water um that's just one example of Trillions you could easily pick. Um, the exercise of muscles is a great one, right? If if you happen to live in conditions where um, it's necessary or useful for you to run a lot, then your muscles in your legs get stronger. And if you're living in conditions where um, it's impossible to run, your legs get weaker, right? Muscles don't that aren't exercised get smaller and less um, developed and that's true with neurons habits that you get into mentally you become you become better at, at doing those mental tasks if you practice them right so if you you practice your lines for memorize lines for a play you memorize things by repeating over and over the same thought process and and it becomes uh something that you can do fluently right that's how you learn languages and everything so it's obvious that we accumulate knowledge as we through active life. And it's obvious that we're not unique among organisms in doing so, um, that they all have adjustments to their conditions of life. And if some of that is heritable, now we're not saying at all, we're not saying all of it is heritable. That would be nonsense. Okay. When a stem cell turns into a cell on the tip of your nose, that doesn't affect the sperm and eggs that are in um, involved in reproducing the next generation, right? They have to start over and build their own cells at the tip of the nose. But there, nevertheless, there are some changes that happen to that sperm and egg cell inside your body that reflect the conditions of life. And that's been shown in humans, okay? And some of that has to do with like epigenetic imprinting. And there's a lot of work on like social justice where 
you know, obesity can become heritable uh, due to environmental factors and things like that. Very fascinating work. So this is not like kooky science. This is mainstream science. These are mainstream results. And and it's gradually becoming part of what um, science is, is scientists, biologists are acknowledging about the world, but they haven't fully integrated this into a complete recognition of the power of what's going on here. So, and the, the power of the unsolved question that we're looking for, where we're looking for a mechanism that a cell could use to take in knowledge from its environment and accumulate that knowledge, integrate that into its system. And then for at least some of that to be heritable. So, um, and whatever this mechanism is, it, it involves genes, but it doesn't change the genes, right? You don't change it. You don't change your gene during your active life. You change all sorts of other shit about your body, but you don't change your genes. So, so it's not that. Um, so what I think of, what I think of this process must involve is some sort of blind search. So the beauty of the theory of natural selection that was invented by Alfred Russell Wallace, um, who published it first, um, by sending it to Charles Darwin in a personal letter. And Darwin, um, had been thinking along the same lines for many years. So without publishing and without sharing it with anyone. And so they are considered co- discoverers of natural selection but um nevertheless i like the story of wallace because he was the junior scientist with the brilliant idea and um darwin was the senior scientist with some of the same ideas and he lent credibility to it and they published together but um wallace was the one that pushed the theory forward by sending his paper to darwin Natural selection is the idea that um, organisms either reproduce, passing on their traits, or they perish without passing on their traits. So the traits that are passed on tend to be more um, better adapted to the conditions in which the organisms find themselves. And so that explains a good bit of change over time. However, it does not explain punctuated equilibrium, which is the fact that when we look at the fossil record, um, I should say uh, the current version of natural selection just attributes uh, genetic change to random mutations um, that are random, that are accidental. And so random accidents happen at a relatively um, steady pace. And if that were the main source of change, you would see, you would, you would expect to see relatively steady transformations over time in species. But instead, what we see is punctuated equilibrium, which is big disasters happen in the fossil record. And then there's rapid evolution and then nothing, you, things stay the same for a very long time. And then there's another disaster and then there's a lot of extinction and then there's another period of rapid evolution so that's called that's called punctuated equilibrium and big debates between Richard Dawkins and uh, Stephen Jay Gould about that in like the 80s but anyway it's all um it, it's all um hard to explain by the genes first theory that that organisms would evolve so quickly during and given the right conditions um, and it seems to be non-random, right? So it seems to be like they evolve into better, more fit um, configurations uh, when conditions change rapidly, and and that's um, that's due to a pistolution. It's due to the fact that the epigenetic changes are being inherited. So how are those epigenetic changes being? um accomplished how are how do organisms learn we don't have a theory for this we don't know how intelligence works we don't know how uh, what what a cell is that it can take in 
um, and better anticipate its surroundings. And what I think is that it has to be some sort of uh, blind search. So um, the beauty of natural selection is that uh, the idea of random changes in traits, and then some of them are selected by the environment passively, right? So some of them are selected for reproduction. That means the environment doesn't have to know ahead of time what's going to work, and neither does the organism. It's blind on both levels. The, or, the environment doesn't care or know what's best for the organism. The organism, at least in terms of its genetic material, doesn't know what's going to work best in the future to reproduce itself. It just randomly changes, and the environment randomly terminates some of those lineages and um, amplifies other ones by reproduction so it's blind it doesn't require creator it doesn't require god it doesn't require any sort of foresight and that's a really powerful idea because it's fully atheistic account of how in very elaborate very smart looking designs can evolve in nature so epistolution suggests and shows that there must be that sort of blind search taking place in bodies, in living bodies during their lifetime, okay? Not just through natural selection at the end of their lives or through their reproductive success, but through the confirmation and the state of their bodies as they're living. How could that be? What? How is that possible? What, an organism seems to be this indivisible whole of made of organic molecules that all integrate together and work together it doesn't seem to be made of anything that could be selected from right for there to be a blind search there has to be a bunch of things proposals to select between right so the the beauty of natural selection is there are all these organisms that nature is selecting between and picking killing this one this one this one leaving that one killing that one killing that one, killing that one. And then you have these that reproduce, boom, and there's more. And then uh, natural selection happens again. And some of these die and some of these die. And then boom, there's some more. And then boom, those reproduce. Okay. And so you have change over time based on the ones that work the best. Well, <laughs> this solution means that there has to be something inside an organism that's being selected when something's being reinforced or encouraged and something else is being destroyed by the environment as we're living. So what could those things be? What units are they? It's not cells, right? Cause our cells all get destroyed and, and the environment's not exactly selecting what cells what cells to 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 reproduce i mean it is in a certain sense but it's not you know every every human has roughly the same proportions of the different cell types um that's not something that varies tremendously and and that wouldn't be the that wouldn't be the basis for our changes anyway that that you suddenly have people with more skin cells or more you know more cardiac cells or something like that i mean that might be part of the ultimate effect, but it's not, that's not the main mechanism of selection, right? It's, it's not picking between cells. Um, it's picking between something else, something we haven't discovered. It means an organism is divided into units that we have not parsed. We have not discovered. What could those units be? Um, this is a really profound, interesting question. And the only way you can explore this question is through your imagination. I can't think of any conceivable way to generate scientific data that would help this, right? You can look at all the data that's out there. You can read every study under the sun, but ultimately you have to use your creativity to try and imagine what this possibility could be, how learning could happen as a, nat as a selective process during the lifetime of an organism. How could it happen? What is the organism made of? What units is it made of that some of the units could be terminated and others could be encouraged or multiplied somehow? And so that's the question of our era. 
in biology. It's something that no one has really gotten their mind around yet. Um, a piss solution is going to be a big deal one day. And everybody in biology is going to have to get their mind around this. But right now, very few people that I can find, practically no one's even asking this question. What can an organism, what units can an organism be composed of that there's a selective process happening between those units during its active life? And that some of that process is then inherited. That process is biased toward function. And some of that biased function is inherited then by the resulting germline cells. So what on earth? My answer to the question is a, a concept called oscillator. So um, my way of thinking of it um, comes from the the history of how I discovered it is that I was thinking a lot about the circadian rhythm and um, the loops of of um, chemical biological process that happen in an organism, right? So there, there are these things called circadian rhythms. Um, they're ways that our body changes reliably over time um, in a 24 hour cycle. Now, circadian rhythms are certainly not the only rhythms in the body. Uh, we have many, many rhythms um, that don't go on a 24 hour cycle, okay? Um, Let's start with the longer ones, right? The rhythm of the lifespan itself. We have uh, senescence that occurs um, in our bodies starting at about age 70 and usually kills us by the time we're 90. Um, we have, uh, that happens at a certain rate, the, the lifespan of an organism. Um, you have puberty uh, is another rhythm, right? That happens at about age 13. Um, menstruation is a, another one that happens every month or so. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the circadian rhythm is just one of those rhythms. Then you have um, shorter rhythms. You have um, breaths, you have heartbeats, uh, you have um, the rhythms of your, of your blood sugar, your insulin system, your um, meta metabolic rhythms um your heartbeat um did i mention that one anyway uh so they're myriad rhythms right there are many many rhythms um there's a rhythm to how often you blink your eyes you know um there are um so what are these things what 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 are these um i would call them oscillators so uh that's a term that comes from this circadian rhythm science. Um, and the only reason why circadian rhythm is a good place to start is because people are, it's easy to identify what is a rhythm. If it repeats every 24 hours, it's a circadian rhythm, right? Um, if it doesn't repeat on a 24 hour cycle, it's hard to say what the rhythm is. Like, so look at a neuron. How often does a particular neuron fire? Well, Sometimes it fires a lot, right? It goes boom, 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 boom. If you happen to be thinking a certain thought that involves that neuron and you're obsessively thinking that over and over, it's going to fire over and over, okay? Like whatever neurons are involved in the the word um, elephant, if I just say elephant, 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 right? I'm firing those same neurons over and over quickly. How long has it been since I said the word elephant? Before that, quite a long time. I don't know if those neurons are involved in the other thoughts I've been thinking or not, but who knows? Anyway, so the neural rhythms, the rhythms that fire neurons are very um, malleable. They're very, very highly um, labile, right? Um, the circadian rhythms are not highly labile. They change a little bit. You can, your circadian rhythm can adjust to changes in time zone, but by and large, you know, you get sleepy at the same time, wake up at the same time, all sorts of changes happen in your body based on that. And it's all programmed, programmed, using that kind of term very loosely here, metaphorically, okay. Um, it's set by uh, this thing called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is a tiny area of just a few hundred cells in the brain that, um, is a sort of master clock 
and it's very sensitive to blue light. And when you see blue light in the morning, it resets your supercosmetic nucleus to some extent, it resets all of your circadian rhythms, including the peripheral clocks and all the organs of your body that are set from the master clock. And they persist. Like if you take up cells from your liver and put them in a Petri dish, they still express that circadian rhythm to some extent for a long time. So they're um, endogenous. Every cell basically has, every cell certainly has rhythms, right? Basically every living cell has circadian rhythms, but they're not, it's, there's some argument about, you know, cells that live in the deep sea and so forth aren't really clocked to the day night cycle of the sun. So, but all cells have, um, life is characterized at all levels by these chemical reactions that repeat themselves, okay? And and here's what I mean by an oscillator. So I have a fairly specific definition. This is a chemical reaction. In a chemical reaction, you have the reactants and then you have the reaction and you have the products, right? So it's a chemical reaction in which the products are themselves also reactants for the same process. And they repeat, given the right conditions and the right inputs and outputs, they repeat on a certain schedule, not a certain schedule. It could be a changeable schedule, but it's on a schedule. Schedule could be, you know, milliseconds in the case of like mitochondria, bumping out ATP or something really quickly inside of a cell, or it could be, um, on the cycle that's uh, much longer, like the rhythms we mentioned. So um, senescence, you know, that happens once every 70 years, approximately. Um, so uh, what is not an oscillator? Okay, that's what an oscillator is. Any kind of chemical reaction could be, it could involve millions of chemicals, like senescence, that involves a whole body, right? The whole human body. It could be millions of chemicals or it could be just a few, right? The Krebs cycle just goes boom, 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 boom over and over really quickly, you know, or somewhere in between like circadian rhythms. They they involve a lot of chemicals and they repeat and they repeat kind of very slowly on a daily cycle, up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, what is not an oscillator? Okay. Something that's not an oscillator is a chemical reaction that just goes one way and then stops, right? So it it's something that like, you know, laying down enamel on your teeth, like that just happens one time, and, you know, um, once the tooth is there, it just hangs out, and, you know, laying down the keratin in your um, fingernails or in your hair, you know, that happens one time and then it stops and the hair is there, right? The hair doesn't cycle the hair is just sort of a one-way reaction now one-way reactions are everywhere in abiotic nature right you see one-way reactions like the oxidization of iron you know in rocks you know rocks the rust rocks that contain iron rusting essentially oxidizing over time you know that um process goes one way and it changes the rocks very slowly over geologic time from one type of rock to another type of rock you can judge the age by the basic slow process that happens there some some of those one-way processes are very fast right um like water evaporating you know it doesn't exactly water cycles but it, it's not really an oscillator right i mean there's no nothing kind of intrinsic about it that if it wasn't for the oscillating uh sun you know that water reaction doesn't contain in itself the the seeds of the next evaporation right once it's water vapor so um those one-way reactions are not oscillators organisms have one-way reactions also right uh water evaporates from us too we don't we have to drink liquid water and then we breathe out water vapor right so that's a one-way transition that's not an oscillator but organisms are characterized by these oscillators and um my theory is that oscillators could be the basis of they could be the units that are selected between so um 
what evidence do I have to show that that's right? Well, it's kind of everything and nothing, right? It's really hard to study this. So, um, but we can just notice that habits form. Okay. Um, take addictions, for example, you know, um, there's a certain chemical basis for addictions, right? It's, it's a, um, a craving is something that, you know, involves your metabolism, your neurotransmitters, and your, um, all of your hormones that are coursing through your bloodstream. Uh, it involves not just the thoughts in your brain, all those, those can be addictive. You can have addictive thought patterns, you know, that, that reoccur and get stronger or weaker based on the conditions that you're living in. Intrinsic factors about yourself, but um, yeah, the, um, the, the, the way that organisms cycle through um cycle right we form habits habit forming and habit forming is so connected to it's so deeply connected to learning right it's it's sort of it's so deeply connected that we actually like our model of machine learning is just um basically running comparisons you know millions of times and trying to form habits mechanically from those connections. I mean, our, our AI is just, um, oh, that's a whole different subject. Let me not get into that right now. <laughs> My criticism of AI, it's pretty long winded, but, um, but why do I think oscillators is the key to this? Um, because of habits, because habits are formed and also because of, use and disuse. So um, going all the way back to Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who was the person who invented the term biology, uh, he was a very intelligent man who lived in the late 18th century, long before Darwin. Um, he believed in use and disuse, uh, inherited characteristics that changed through use and disuse. And that has been ridiculed in the 20th century wrongly because it clearly is a part of the epigenetic changes that now we know are inherited use and disuse does influence evolution we don't know how but we know it does because it influences development right like as i said you know if, for example um let's suppose you study archery okay and you begin using your eyes and your hands in a certain way to shoot arrows at a target and you become very good at that by doing that you don't become good at it just by thinking about it <laughs> you have to do it right you have to form the habit through use uh you get better at it right and some of that's your muscles a lot of that's your neural connections and some of that's your ability to maintain your steady focus through the use of your hormones and your your um your whole body system, your breath, you know, your digestion, all that is involved in you holding the the arrow still and releasing it just the right way. Um, very finely tuned skill is a result of use and disuse. It's built through the skills that all the skills we have, including everything, including getting, getting along with people. It's all built through use and disuse. And um, some of that, some tiny part of that is inherited we now know. So um, use and disuse is clearly part of it. Habits are part of it. Use and disuse. You know, if you, if you don't, if you don't use a skill or a muscle or a structure, um, it tends to disintegrate over time. And Lamarck understood that. He extrapolated that way too far. Like his views, his ideas were not like modern by any sense stretch of the imagination but he was someone who proposed for for one of the first he was a defender of evolution in the very early days when no one believed in evolution he was someone who understood that evolution must have occurred part of his explanation for that was use and disuse and it turns out that particular part of that explanation was 
correct, <laughs> even though everyone thinks of it as false. It's actually, it actually must be correct. And so, but we're kind of back to the drawing board because we don't know how use and disuse gets incorporated into uh, cellular processes. So, um, so oscillators um, are also implicated by the fact that um, what we at least perceive as greater intelligence in organisms. Um, and I would define intelligence here as the um, just the sort of plasticity of behavior, adaptive plasticity in behavior, right? Um, a tree, for example, like can't change its behavior very much based on condition, you know, changes in conditions, right? A tree can either, it can grow towards the light in a smart way. It can um, perhaps communicate underground through mycelia in a spooky way. Um, it can certainly grow, direct its growth patterns in an intelligent way to find the resources that it needs, but it can't radically change. It can't move. Um, it can't speak. It can't uh, work in teams to accomplish, you know, hunting and stuff like that. So very smart organisms like crows and dolphins and whales and humans and elephants, chimpanzees and um, baboons and cephalopods, and octopuses. So all, all these very smart organisms have lots and lots of neurons. So what is weird about the neuron in terms of cells? There are 200 different types of cells. Um, all cells communicate with one another. Um, and how do we know this? Because they differentiate, right? So the cell realizes where it is in the body and what it should be doing based on that location and the conditions that it's in. So if you um, have a stem cell and you can turn adult, you know, differentiated cells back into stem cells uh, by using these things called the Yamanaka factors, which are four genes that were discovered that reverse the age of cells. Amazing, mind-blowing thing that we're, we've been able to do since the 1980s, create these stem cells out of adult cells. So time can, senescence can run, development and senescence can run backwards as well as forwards. But anyway, normally it runs forwards from a stem cell to a, a differentiated cell. And um, we know that all the cells are talking to one another because these stem cells differentiate based on where they are in the organism into different types of cell, right? So if you cut yourself, the skin regenerates, okay? It doesn't grow into something else. It doesn't turn into a bone or a, you know, liver. It turns back into skin and just the right type of skin and even the hair follicles regrow. I mean, I have scars on my arms and hands and face and um, uh, torso, you know, that, you um, decades old scars but most of them have grown right back into the you know type of tissue that you would expect to be there i mean i'm looking at one on my scar on my finger that's got it's like a v shape and inside the v there's a tiny bit of skin that you can tell is a little bit different from the surrounding skin but essentially all the rest of it has grown back into you know, there's normal hairs and it's a normal um, finger, you know, regeneration and healing. Okay, that's that's the cells talking to one another and telling each other what to become, what goals to have, how to behave. So we know that all cells talk to one another. Well, what's different about neurons? So neurons, you can imagine... All these other cells, they do do many, many things, right? They do all this other stuff, right? Um, your liver, you know, processes your blood. Your heart pumps your blood. Your lungs take in oxygen and they form this structure that does a certain thing. Well, what's in your head is a simplified 
cell. The neuron is the simplest cell in a certain way. Its only purpose is to communicate with other cells, right? At least that's how it seems structurally. We can presume, I mean, each neuron has 10,000 connections, some of them very, very long reaching axons that go long, long way to reach to another neuron and 10,000 of them in each neuron. And you have 80 billion neurons or 86 billion neurons. 86 billion times 10,000, that's how many connections are in your human brain. And that's not unusual based on our size as an ape. So like a gorilla has the same roughly. Profound number of connections and those neurons seem to be specially adapted, designed to just send impulses to one another that's all they do is just communicate across these synapses and that integrative process reaches all over the body through the nervous system right and it controls your behavior and makes your behavior intelligent so um so that indicates that this integrative process is um a matter of oscillations Right. I mean, so the neuron is just an oscillator. It 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 fires and it builds up a certain potential and then it fires on a some schedule. It doesn't fire just boom, 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 boom on a regular schedule, although there are waves, you know, but it, it fires based on the conditions, you know, and it oscillates based on the conditions. And then those oscillations are carried out through the whole body. And they result in function, intelligent function. So, um, there again, in the case of neurons, it's not the cell that's selected by the environment. The number of neurons you have doesn't roughly change. It's not like neurons are driven extinct and other neurons are reproduced all the time. That does happen a little bit, but not very much. And that's not the main mechanism of learning the main mechanism of learning is change tiny subtle changes in the connection the strengths of the connections in between neurons so you think of those as oscillations some oscillations are made stronger and other oscillations if they're not ever used if somebody tells you a phone number and you end up using that phone number every day to call that person these days you don't do that because you've got a memory in your phone but in the old days uh, when I was in high school, I had called my girlfriend who lived in another state for a while and because I met her at boarding school. And I would call her number, um, 917-671, whatever. I remember some of it. <laughs> and, um, you know, I would call it by memory every day. And so that number stayed with me for a long time. I've lost it now. But um, it stayed with me for a long time. It was deeply ingrained in my memory, those seven numbers. Um, whereas, you know, many other phone numbers were told to me during that period of time. And I forgot them immediately if I didn't write them down. So using that number must represent some sort of oscillation through the neurons, through the neural pathways, right. Um, that somehow is strengthened and the numbers that I, didn't remember that was a different oscillation that was not strengthened and through use and disuse i think you can see something like that is happening in organisms something is getting retained and something is getting discarded so there is some darwinian selection i don't even want to call it darwinian it's epistolution it's um it's learning So, um, yeah, I think I'm going to stop right there and try to let that sink in. I'm going to see where I'm going in the next, um, I'm enjoying this. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep doing these little broadcasts for a few minutes here until I get tired. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you got something out of that. I hope I made myself clear. Uh, I think the next one. I'm going to do is going to be even better because it's going to be me imagining the future and talking about incumulation, acceleration, and equalitarianism. 
um, this whole lecture was about accumulation. It was about the part of epistolution that, that is taking in knowledge. And uh, the other two subjects, acceleration and um, acceleration and uh, equalitarianism are even more fascinating. So stay tuned. Thank you. Talk to you later. <laughs>